Monday in Holy Week, The Fear of Death by St. Cyprian Let him fear to die, and only him, who unborn of water and of the Spirit, is the property of hellfire. Let him fear to die, who is without title, in the cross and passion of Christ. Let him fear to die, who is to pass from death here into the second death. Let him fear to die, on whom, at his going away from life, an eternal flay will lay pins that never cease. Let him fear to die, on whom the longer delay confers this boon, that his tortures and groans will begin the latter. We should remember that we ought to do, not our own will, but the will of God, according as the Lord has commanded us daily to pray. How misplaced is it, and how perverse, while we make it our prayer that the will of God may be done, yet when God calls us and withdraws us from this world, not at once to obey the requirements of His will. We oppose and withstand, and after the manner of consummatious servants we are carried into the presence of our Lord with reluctance and sadness, departing hence under the constraint of necessity, not the obedience of choice, and desire to be honored of Him with heavenly rewards, whom we approach against our will? Why then do we pray and beseech that the kingdom of heaven may come, if bondage on earth delights us? Why in oft-repeated prayers do we inquire and ask that the day of the kingdom may hasten, when we desire and have it rather in our own wish to serve the devil here than to be reigning with Christ? Neither ought we to sorrow for those our brethren, who by the Lord's summons have been set at liberty from the life below, assured that they are not gone away, but gone forward that in departing from us they are but leading the way, as is men's want in a journey or upon a voyage, that we owe them our affection than our lamentations, and ought not to put on the garb of black here, while they have already taken on them white raiment there, since occasion must not be given to the Gentiles for the deserved and just reproach, that while we say of men they are alive with God, we mourn for them as extinct and perished, and that a faith, which we manifest by language and utterance, is disproved in the testimony of our feelings and thoughts. So doing we play false to our hope and faith. Unreal, counterfeit, fictitious do those things appear which we affirm. If nothing profits to set our virtue in our words, and our acts to undo the truth, in a word, the Apostle Paul condemns and rebukes and blames any who sorrow at the departing of them who are dear to them. I would not, saith he, have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow, not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which are asleep in Jesus will God bring with him. They, he says, sorrow in the departing of their friends, which have no hope. But we who live by hope, and believe in God, and are assured that Christ suffered for us, and that he rose again, abiding in Christ, and having resurrection by him, and in him. Wherefore do we either ourselves unwillingly depart forth from life, or lament and grieve for those of us who do depart, as though they perished? Christ himself, our Lord and God, cautions us and says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he die, shall live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall not die eternally. If we believe in Christ, let us put faith in his words and promises, and since we shall not die eternally, let us pass in joyful assurance unto Christ, with whom forever we shall both live and reign, and dying at this present by death, gain the transit to immortality. Eternal life cannot follow, unless it has been given us to depart hence. Nor is this departure but transition when the journey of time is concluded, a transit unto things eternal. Who shall not make speed unto better things? Who does not long to be changed and made anew into the likeness of Christ, and to gain an earlier entrance to the dignity of heavenly grace? It is the spoken word of Paul the Apostle. Our conversation, saith he, is in heaven. From whence also we look for the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change the body of our humility, conforming it to be the body of his glory. That such we shall be, Christ the Lord also promises when in these words he prays the Father for us, that we may be with him, and live with him in the eternal seats, and be joyful in the realms of heaven. Father, 
I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, and may see the glory which thou gavest me before the world began. He who is going to the seat of Christ, to the brightness of the heavenly kingdom, ought not to weep and lament, but rather, according to the promise of the Lord, according to his belief of the truth, to be joyful in this his departure and translation. Thus, according we find Enoch was translated, who pleased God as divine scripture bears witness and speaks in Genesis, and Enoch pleased God, and he was not found after, because God translated him. His having been found well-pleasing in the sight of God wrought for him a translation out of this infectious world. Thus also the Holy Spirit teacheth by Solomon that they who please God are earlier taken hence, more speedily set free, lest, abiding longer in this world, they are polluted by its contact with them. He was taken away, saith he, lest that wickedness should alter his understanding, for his soul pleased God, wherefore hast he to take him away from the midst of wickedness. Then also in the Psalms, the soul devoted in spiritual faith unto its God, make haste unto the Lord, saying, How amiable are thy tabernacles, O God of hosts! My soul longeth and hasteth unto the courts of God. It is for him to wish to remain long below, who finds below his enjoyment, whom a flattering and deceiving world attracts by the enticement of earthly pleasure. Furthermore, whereas the world hates the Christian, wherefore love that which hates thee, and not rather follow Christ, who hath redeemed and loves thee? John in his epistle cries out and says, warning us that we be made not lovers of the world, while we indulge in carnal desires. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the lust of the world is lust of the flesh, and lust of the eyes, and pride of life, which is not of the Father, but of the lust of the world. And the world will pass away, and the lust thereof. But he that doth the will of God abideth forever, even as God abideth forever. Rather, dearest brethren, in fullness of spirit, firm faith, and hearty courage, let us be prepared unto all the will of God, shutting out our dread of death, and thinking of the deathlessness which comes beyond it. Herein, let us manifest that we live as we believe, on the one hand, by not lamenting the departure of them we love, and on the other, when the day of our own summons comes, by going without delay, and with a ready mind, unto the Lord who calls us. Even as the servants of God ought thus to do, now ought they to do so much more in a world which has begun to crumble, and is beset with storms of harassing calamity. For seeing ill things are begun, and since we know that worse are impending, we ought to account it our greatest gain to take our departure hence the sooner. If the walls of our mansion were tottering with age, the roof shaking above you, and the edifice, wasted and wearied out, threatening an instant ruin of its time and feeble the structure, would you not in all your haste go forth from it? If when you were on a voyage of swelling and troublous tempest tossed up the waves in its strength and betokened impending shipwreck, would you not hurry forward to the port? See a world tottering and going down, witnessing to its own dissolution, not merely in the old age of things, but in their conclusions. And thank you not God? Are you not rejoiced that escaping by an earlier removal you are rescued from overhanging ruins and shipwrecks and plagues? We ought to consider, dearest brethren, we ought indeed to retain in our meditations that we have renounced the world and are continuing here for this season as strangers and pilgrims. Let us embrace the day which makes over each of us to his own resting place, which after rescuing us hence and ridding us of the chains of flesh places us back in paradise in the heavenly kingdom. What man that is journeying abroad doth not hasten backward to his native land, who that is speeding a voyage towards him he loves, longs not with more ardor for a prosperous wind, that so he may embrace his friends the sooner. Paradise we are to reckon for our native land. Patriarchs are now our parents, wherefore not haste and run to behold our country, to salute our parents. It is a large and loving company who expects us there. Parents, brothers, 
children, a manifold and numerous assemblage longing after us, who have security of their own immortality, still feel anxiety for our salvation. What a common gladness, both to them and us, when we pass into their presence and their embrace. And, O oh, sweet heavenly realms, where death can never terrify and life can never end, ah, perfect and perpetual bliss, there is the glorious company of the apostles, there is the assembly of prophets exulting, there is the innumerable multitude of martyrs crowned after their victory of strife and passion. There are virgins triumphant who have overcome all earthly passions. There are merciful men obtaining mercy who fulfilled the works of righteousness by dealing food and bounty to the poor and in obedience to the instructions of the Lord translated the inheritance of earth into the treasures of heaven. To these, dearest brethren, let us with eager longings hasten. Let it be the portion which we desire speedily to be among them, speedily to be gone to Christ. God behold this thought of ours, this purpose of our mind, and faith may the Lord Jesus Christ witness, who will make the recompense of his glory the larger, according as man's longings after him have been the stronger. Amen.